Broadcast has been set. All right, good evening. I would like to call to order our Academic Achievement Committee meeting. My name is Shayla Adams Stafford, and I'm the chair of this committee and District 4 representative of the Prince George's County Board of Education. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone for being here this evening. I want to acknowledge our new member of the Academic Achievement Committee, board member uh, Zipporah Miller. Dr. Miller is also the newest board member of the Board of Education and was appointed by our county executive to represent the constituents of District 5. Welcome, Dr. Miller. Um, Thank you. And good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ellis, can you please call the roll? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Mrs. Adam Stafford. Present. Mr. Sarone Ruiz. Here. Dr. Z. Miller. Present. Mr. Valentine. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to adopt, adopt the May 23rd, 2022 meeting agenda? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. The agenda is adopted. And may I have a motion to approve the April 25th, 2022 meeting minutes? So moved. All right. Second. second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 The agenda is adopted. <clears throat> we have no registered public comment speakers for this evening. And so I am now going to turn it over to Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Judy White, who will introduce our speakers for this evening from the administration. Thank you everyone for being here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening we have Dr. Sheila Jackson with us from our Family and School Partnerships to talk a little about what her office does in support of schools. And additionally, we have our three amazing associate superintendents and our amazing director of curriculum instruction who will join us to talk briefly about our work with our Bridge to Excellence School. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Jackson for her presentation. Thank you, Dr. White, and thank you Board of Education members for welcoming me as a part of this committee. Uh, our presentation tonight is infusing universal design for learning as we engage families and community. And I'm excited to be a part of this, this presentation because um, our division of curriculum instruction has a clear roadmap for all of us to look at and support. And so in our work, if you could click to the next two slides, we'll just see how our small department works with all schools at, to support families to help build the capacity of their children to be successful in academics. So as you can see, uh, we're the Department of Family and School Partnerships under Dr. Helen Coley. And uh, along with my secretary, there are three specialists who serve all 208 schools, but we're supported uh, in uh, select schools, 79 schools at this point, that have parent engagement assistance assigned to them to also help them deepen um, their work with engaging families effectively. And then the training that we provide to them each month, Universal Design for Learning drives what we do because we want that model to also support our engagement of families, what their children are learning and how they learn needs to be supported with strong partnerships from families. So you can click to the next slide for me. So, you know, even before COVID-19, we said as a system that family engagement matters. And since COVID-19, it's even more important that we reach out to and embrace our families and engage them as partners in the process of helping our children learn. So we, as a staff, universally design what we do. And if you could click to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, when we talk about engaging families, part of what we've learned from Universal Design for Learning is the connections. We have to make sure that we connect well with families and interact with them as equal partners, making sure that we have strong two-way communications. So as a district, um, all of our schools are equipped and offices are equipped 
to make sure that we are reaching out to and engaging families and listening to them, getting input from them with two-way communication channels um, so that we can keep our communications flowing and really learn from and work with each other. Next slide. So this uh, all applies to a families again as building partnerships, as well as recognizing barriers that may prevent meaningful engagement. So our office works uh, directly with schools, work with our associate superintendents and instructional directors to help overcome barriers that may prevent um, meaningful engagement. And when we talk about meaningful engagement, we're really talking about what are the things that are important to families? Uh, you know, how do they need to hear from us? Um, what do they need to hear from us so that it's meaningful? A lot of times schools will complain, oh, we planned something and nobody came, but did you talk to parents beforehand? Did you get any input about what's meaningful for them? That's what universal design for learning helps us do. It helps us communicate how important it is to make sure that our communication is two-way. Next slide. So we have the mechanism within our department of what we call the Family Institute. And Mr. Valentine is very familiar with this because he's one of our presenters. Um, but we provide weekly workshops to support parents. And the workshops that we provide are designed to build their capacity uh, and build what we call shared responsibility for supporting children. Like you said, school system staff work diligently we need our families to support and work with us and we open up those pathways so that we can so parents tell us you know this is what we need to know this is what we need the system to help us with and so we have sessions even like executive skills for for students how do we teach our children as parents to be good scholars, you know, what are the skills that we need to reinforce at home? So we, we provide those types of workshops uh, through Family Institute, but also many of our schools now have their own parent academies. We've reached out to them and said, you know, you know your parent community even better than we do. You know what their needs are. So make sure that as schools, we're establishing opportunities to, to gather parents together to look at the academic outcomes that we're trying to achieve and engaging them on helping us to do that. Next slide. So we also have, uh, we've been delighted, we were selected by West Ed to um, pilot uh, a number of schools to, act, to create what we call academic parent teacher teams. And those teams, deal directly with the data that that school has gathered about what its children's needs are and works directly with parents. So it will say in third grade, children are struggling with this concept. So the workshops are designed specifically around whatever those weaknesses are. And that strengthens parents' ability to work with their children. And it also builds a, a stronger relationship between parents and teachers. And we're looking, hopefully, to, to expand that model as we, you know, near the end of the pilot. But I, we will be sharing data with uh, Dr. Coley and Dr. White about, you know, the outcomes that we saw from the academic parent teacher teams. There are some schools that are yeah, doing it on their own, Sorry, but we are guiding the implementation in about five schools right now. So this is what we do under, under um, in the utilization of universal design for learning. Family Institute really looks at providing options for parents. So right now we have been in a virtual mode for the last almost two years now. Before that, and hopefully in the future, we will go back to providing face-to-face -face, uh, opportunities uh, and all of it is about recruiting their interests, finding out from parents. So we survey parents, what is it that you need to know to be able to do to support your children? And there have been topics like love languages or, you know, like I said before, executive thinking skills or effective parent teacher conferences. All of those have been driven by parent input that they want to know about, you know, how do I become better? as a parent and supporting my child. 
We make sure that, you know, what we do is again, a value to parents and it's important to them. Uh, we, we try not to do what uh, some of the scholars call um, engagement by accident. Our family engagement initiatives are really intentional and we make sure that we, you know, they give value to the parent teacher relationship. We want to also always foster collaboration and community. And we also engage parents in helping us plan. Um, nothing is, is done to parents in Prince George's County Public Schools. Our whole philosophy is that we work together. We co-create the learning opportunities for parents. So I'm always excited to hear from parents. And many of the parents who come and speak for the board meetings, um, I get, I give them a card, you know, you know, I need to talk to you about how we can engage you further and get ideas from you about how we get better at what we do. And then I, the last thing is just about making sure that all along the way, we are helping parents and supporting them uh, in dealing with, you know, all of the, the uh, I call it trauma, that we've been through with COVID-19, some coping skills, some strategies. We've even had uh, under Family Institute uh, financial literacy. We have that twice a year, uh, making sure that parents understand that, helping parents uh, with the helping their children, you know, find summer work. All of those are opportunities that are part of making sure that our model is planned and, and designed to look at the comprehensive needs of our families. So I don't wanna take up too much time. I know Judy, I know there are other presenters as well, but I just wanna you know, just say that thank you for having me tonight. And again, our mantra in family engagement is that the next slide, you know, family engagement is everyone's responsibility. Um, so if you can go ahead to the next one as well. There we go. So if there are any questions, is that the process? Do you have questions now or do you want to do that later? Sure, we can um, ask some questions here now. Um, so first I'll uh, see if my colleagues have any questions and then I can ask some as well. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> so, um, while my colleagues are maybe getting some questions or, or thoughts together, I'll ask a few questions. And uh, and I just want to thank you <clears throat> for sharing that uh, connection that you all have made between UDL and parent engagement. And I think that's definitely unique, you know, thinking about it from uh, a student instructional standpoint too, right? You know, thinking about the ways in which students learn. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about uh, was around sort of the way in which we engage parents um, uh, in person. I know that that has been a challenge, you know, during COVID, um, but I wanted to know if you all have leveraged like home visits um, as another method uh, to engage with families, especially some of our families, our English language learning families or parents that are new to our school system or new to different communities. <clears throat> I, I've heard of some districts even doing like sidewalk conferences, you know, <laughs> they're not able to go inside, but still um, meeting parents where they are and really talking to them about the goals that they have for their students. Um, I know that the Flamboyant uh, foundation in DC does a lot of that work. And so I just was curious to know um, what you've done maybe in the past or thoughts you may have in the future as the world starts to hopefully open up again. <laughs> and I love the way you said that as the world opens up again. However, there are schools currently that actually are implementing home visits. It's not a school system policy or requirement. But some schools looking at their own data and looking at opportunities that they need to interact with specific families will go to home visits. Um, and, and we've learned a lot of that from the Flamboyant uh, organization because they are partners. I, I love you know, talking with them and, and learning with them. I would love it if they would adopt Prince George's. So if you have any power to do that, <laughs> that would be great. But you know, they are, they have, they have fabulous tools. Um, that they provide to districts. 
And, and so we have been to some of their conferences. We've actually presented beside them in conferences to talk about specifically home visits. The research says that's the number one way yes. of building partnerships with families is to actually conduct home visits. And so, uh, yes, some of our schools are doing that, uh, but it's not a universal um, mandate that anyone does. And we often uh, work closely with student services to make sure that we have the right supports, you know, before we go into homes and having the right people to go. And, and there's actually a script that student yeah. service uses as well. So um, making it a very positive, you know, exchange. And, and many parents who've had home visits feel like that's the only way, you know, to, to really reach out to them because they, they are so moved that school system personnel would come to their home to interact with them. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for that. I'm wondering how the board can support with fostering those types of partnerships with like the Flamboyant Foundation or even other organizations that can support with in-person visits because you're, you're right, that is one of the best ways uh, to really pull in parents 100%. There's so much I could say there, but I wanted to see if any of my colleagues had any other questions or thoughts as well. Uh, this, this is Curtis, as you can see. I, I, and it's good to see Dr. Jackson. Um, and for me, I think the, the key word is communication. And I, I just wanted to ask particularly, like, what have you learned um, with regard to communicating with parents, which is like you're sort of whether it be through the text messaging, through robocalls, uh, and, and some of the more traditional ways of communicating? What are the best practices that you've seen? Similarly, in the inverse, um, communicating parent needs and sort of gathering information and what's the best way to do that. I think, you know, we look about, you know, where sort of parent engagement was when we were all, when, I would say when I was in school um, and it was, it was pretty traditional, but now when you have working families and, you know, not seeing, depending on the school, as well attended PTA meetings, obviously, even when they were in person, just because people, I don't, I think it's an indication of people's interest or engagement in their children's education. I think it's a function of just the, the changing lives of, of men and women in, in the working field. But how are we gathering information about how parents can get involved in the school? We often hear about parents wanting to get involved, but don't know how, or they you know don't know when. Um, and so what are the best practices you've seen across the district on sharing information with parents about what the school is doing and what the district's doing and some of our school programs and applying for specialty programs, but also how we're gathering information from parents on how they can get more involved in our school. So in a, in a word, how are we doing with communication and what are you seeing that's working well? So as far as communication is concerned, uh, I'm just proud, Prince George's County proud of our division of communications because we're very conscious about all of the different languages, first of all, that we need to acknowledge and serve. Um, that has been uh, across districts across the country. The, one of the biggest problems is making sure that uh, language reflects the people that we serve. So that is one of the important things that we've done as a district. Um, we've also uh, set up the portals that communicate two way, whether it's Class Dojo and Dr. Coley's here. So she might want to chime in, but I know we use Class Dojo. Uh, we use other portals like that where teachers and parents communicate frequently. Um, so the, the teacher can post something and a parent can respond. And, and I've talked to parents who love that. They just, they you know are so excited that they get those messages from teachers that they have a question, they can reach right back to that teacher. Um, so those um, are opportunities that we have set up systemically. Um, we also have policies in place that, you know, when a parent calls or a parent emails that, you know, the expectation is that somewhat the teacher responds within, I think Dr. Cole is 48 hours they have to respond. And we, and so that's something that if that doesn't happen, parents know they can reach right to the instructional director, you know, the principal instructional director, because we always promote following protocol, you know, to make sure that if they have a concern or they have a question that it's answered promptly. Uh, that is a commitment that the system has. Uh, we also train our uh, frontline staff uh, in communication with using language links uh, but, and applying good customer service. Um, 
because that has been, you know, in the past, a, a comment from, from parents about the lack of customer service in some places where, you know, nobody answers the phone. But that doesn't happen under Dr. Coley. <laughs> you know, we they, people need to know they, the phones will be answered. And if not, we need to respond immediately to make sure we can get support. But I think it, it's, it's, it's about all of us working together you know, we're, we're really joined in this work. So it's, it doesn't just fall on the classroom teacher. It doesn't just fall on the school. Everybody has a responsibility. And we provide that training for parents. How do you communicate effectively with your child's teacher, with your child's school, you know, with your board of education member, anyone in that chain of protocol, how do you best communicate with them? And so it's part of it's part of our training in Family Institute, but also PTAs have asked us to come and talk to their parents at their meetings about, you know, what is the best way to communicate is whether it's a concern or whether you want to be involved. We also have developed survey instruments that we share with schools uh, to so the schools can individually survey their parents about what are the things that are, are of interest to you? What are your needs? How can we better work together? So those surveys help schools individually work better with their families. Uh, our school system has its bi, uh, biannual uh, school climate survey where we you know, find out you know, what parents' needs are, uh, what parents' perceptions are. That data helps us as a district also you know, look at our programming and look at our training that we need. Perhaps we need to do things better from a systemic view. Thank, thank you very much. And I'd, I'd just say to my colleague, Adam Stafford's point around home visits, I'd be curious, uh, Madam Chair, about our staff doing some research on the use of Title I funds um, to, to fund that and whether, whether it be some of our, we used to call them parent, parent outreach advisors. I'm not sure we call them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but those who are in, in those schools, uh, but also maybe potentially parents. Um, and I yeah. imagine, in, you know, we, you have to change the job description and I'm sure there's some, some mm -hmm. funding uh, constraints to that, but whether there are resources, both foundational and nonprofit wise or through Title I, that could particularly in target schools like Title I schools or schools that we are seeing um, that are high need to see like, you know, just say like, let's pilot in three schools and see what the impact is. Um, and and then look at it, you know, to expand it. But I have seen that both locally and, and in other states that has, has worked. I just wanted to put it out there as something we could particularly put a, um, a thumbnail in and say, let's just see whether there's resources out there yeah. publicly or privately, and then look at what the particular process of piloting that would look like. That's a really great point. I just took a note of that. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, board member Valentine. Did any other board members have any questions? Good evening. Mine's a really quick question. Um, uh, Dr. Jackson, this is excellent. And the use of UDL um, to, to really increase parent involvement is just um, innovative. I was curious, during the pandemic, we all kind of shifted, it, you know, to reaching parents in a different way, you know, going through virtual means. I'm wondering, did parent en engagement or did we notice where the parent engagement increased then in terms of coming to parent teacher conferences, coming to some of the weekly workshops because they didn't have to drive? And if that wondering was there, is it something we want to consider where we say we can reach them to coming to us because we want them to come to us face to face, but also do something virtual for those who can step away from work for a half hour and then get back? Well. I'll, I'll share with you one of our anecdotes is that we noticed for our family institute sessions in the evening that used to be in person, people would come to our uh, auditorium at John Carroll, we provide a little dinner, we would provide free childcare, every child would get like some kind of book or gift to go home with. We got more people participating virtually these last two years than we did in person. And parents share with us, quite honestly, they didn't have to get their children bundled up and in the car. They didn't have to you know, rush home and feed, feed them, give them dinner. Uh, they were meeting with us from the comfort of their home. Uh, we even were able to flex hours uh, around parents. Uh, you know, sometimes we were 6.30 to 
6.30 or 6.30 to 8.00. Sometimes we were 8.00 to 9.00. I mean, parents asked for that. And so they seem to be more engaged, uh, especially in the learning opportunities. Um, and, and working with some of our PTAs, um, the same thing was, was for them as well. The ones that were able to continue through COVID had more participation virtually. And again, it was the same thing, not having to drive to the school, you know, not having to worry about childcare. Um, and so we've learned a lot and, you know, that does give us some thoughts going into the future. Um, parents now know that they have that option, you know, and it does, everything doesn't have to happen at the school. We even had back to school nights virtually. And I know our uh, associate superintendents uh, can talk, you know, more about that. Uh, but just the ones that I sat in on, you know, the attendance was high. People were engaged, and again, they liked it from the comfort of their home, but, th but they were tuned in for the information as well. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Good evening, everyone. And if I could add to that, Dr. Miller, uh, during one of the town meetings that was scheduled and held by Dr. Golson, one of the questions specific to parents was to ask them which you know, methodology they prefer. And there, were a, there was a large percentage of parents that indicated during the poll that they would love to continue with having virtual back to school nights, as well as virtual parent teacher conferences. So that was a large volume of parents and it has not, um, it, it, it takes away from the parking lots that are full to capacity during back to school nights and it allows for more parents to uh, participate. So that did in fact occur and um, it was quite successful. Thank you, that's great to hear. So Thank we're you. considering as moving forward to leverage technology as a means to get to homes. Cause I know we talk about home visits and I know how important they are, but you know, I also would like to capitalize on some of our lessons learned. And I can hear from what you are expressing that you've already done that, you've surveyed the parents and you're saying, hey, they want virtual, so we're gonna consider how we can get into their homes first. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question, Dr. Miller. Um, one last thing I wanted to know, I know that we do a lot of surveys uh, in order to gather information from uh, families. Do we have any idea on our response rate there about you know, out of all of the families that we have, you know, what would be our just average or typical response rate to a survey that we may send out? <clears throat> and I think really where I'm going with this is, I'm wondering um, what are some other methods to, I know that you've mentioned a few of them, but other ways in which we can connect with families that may not, um, you know, answer an online survey. So, um... I know the, the main surveys that have gone out um, uh, from the school system have been the school climate survey, and that would be Dr. Schrader, who could probably give us the data, the return on that, um, and then individual schools. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Golson has shared, um, well, Dr. Coley just shared that Dr. Golson had survey parents. Um, and I'm not sure, Dr. Coley, are there other surveys that have been yes, done? Yes, there are. There are also need assessments. All of our community school parents are provided an opportunity to participate in needs assessments. As to the actual return percentage-wise, I don't know that currently, um, but we can get that information for you. Um, and as referenced by Dr. Jackson, Dr. Um, Strader would have the actual percentages of parent participants during our climate surveys. And we can actually get from you as well, from Dr. Williams Horton, the actual percentages of parents that you know, responded during our needs assessment data and needs assessments that are actually given to all of our parents of uh, students that participate in community schools. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Coley. And I think what I'd be interested in as a board member and colleagues, you can chime in here if you agree, but <clears throat> I'd love to see, you know, when you see some trends emerge, like you mentioned cu customer service, you know, how could we take a splice of respondents and possibly 
do some focus groups if that's not something that's happening already but just trying to go deeper with you know what let's get some qualitative information as well that can provide okay maybe there needs to be more funding from the board on something very specific you know that we can do to support whatever those trends are in some of the data that you're seeing district-wide through some of those me uh, mechanisms like a focus group. And I will say one thing that the board <clears throat> is going to be working on and focusing on is how do we support some of your goals around language access? Something we need to do as a board is have all of our information in compliance with Maryland law needs to be translated. <laughs> That's something that we can do to support. But then also we need to have people that are working in our, you know, our central offices to support families that are calling in that need language access support as well. I mean, that's something that we definitely as a board, um, I know other of my colleagues are interested in making sure that we're in compliance there. So thank you so much. If there were any other just comments there and then we're gonna keep going and, and moving on. I like what you referenced just a few moments ago, focus yes. groups. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jackson and I have been in communication around focus groups, including parents, specifically those parents that are participating in our in our feeder school patterns. Okay. So she is working along with the principals to actually schedule opportunities for such so that we're able to create that particular structure that you just referenced. That's awesome. And I would even say for us at the board, from a district level, if you're seeing trends across the county in a particular area, if there were some district level focus groups and you said, hey, board members, this is what we're seeing. This is what we need support with funding for. That would be really helpful. I think um, I can speak for my colleagues on that as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for that um, presentation. And thank you, Dr. Coyley and um, others who have been supporting in that uh, effort as well. I appreciate your presentation. <clears throat> and so I'll turn it back to Dr. White uh, for item 3.2. Thank you so much. And thank you to my colleague, Dr. Coley, who's joined us. I was going to introduce you, but Sheila did a great job pulling you, <laughs> pulling you right on in. Um, so next, we're going to have our, again, our associate superintendents and our director of curriculum instruction come before you and talk a little bit about our bridge to excellence schools and academic achievement. And I believe Dr. McDaniel is going to, if she has rights to share, that she's going to drive the PowerPoint. Yes, I don't have rights just yet, um, but if someone could update that, then I could share. Great, Great. and I believe Dr. Merrill is going to get us started. All right, good evening, everyone. And can you good actually, evening. Oh, good evening. You can actually, here we are. All right. So this evening, our session outcomes, we're going to discuss the bridge to X, the, we're going to discuss the identified bridge to excellent schools and discuss the supports provided to the bridge to excellent schools by the division of school support and leadership and the division of academics. So our bridge to excellent schools, we have 11 elementaries four middle schools and three high schools. Within there, we actually have the Crossland feeder pattern that's one of our focus groups that um, actually the elementary, the middle and the high school are all part of our Bridge to Excellence um, support. Why these schools? So the Bridge to Excellence schools were identified based on historical data indicating chronically low performance of um, the past several years Initially, all 18 identified schools received a one or two star um, rating on the um, Every Student Succeeds Act rating in 2018, which is actually the last time, I mean, well, 2019 was the last time that we actually had the ratings. And since that time, nine of our schools have increased to a three star rating, according to ESSA. Good evening, everyone. Turn over to David. Yes, uh, so we always uh, tag team. So basically when we talk about our supports provided to schools from the Office of School Leadership, uh, the goals that you see posted are general goals for all schools. First goal, goal being number one, ultimately what is the impact that we're having on, uh, on our students? And so when we look at uh, tiering our support for schools, we look at one, the star ratings, Two, whether or not they receive CSI designations or CSI designations from the state. Our second goal that we ultimately focus on is one, 
if we're going to impact students, what is going to be our impact on the leadership within the building? Next slide, please. So as the area office, we've um, organized our work into three buckets, leadership development, data accountability, and monitoring, and monitoring instruction. These are, are important because as we transition to the third slide, you will see as the uh, supports are outlined, they fall into each one of these buckets. Now listed here are all of the supports or activities that are provided to all schools during the course of the year. I refer back to the previous slide just to uh, emphasize that for our leadership development, in addition to all schools receiving at minimum direct uh, support or meetings from their instructional director, a minimum of two times per month, they're also receiving additional support from our professional, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not professional, our principal leadership development coaches provide direct one-on-one -on -one support. Also, they re re receive support in regards to data accountability from the data performance specialist. The data performance specialist provides uh, ongoing session, monthly sessions throughout the year. But when we talk about our bridge to excellent schools, these supports are provided one-on-one -on -one with the principal, either in a small group setting with their admin teams, and also uh, having opportunities to bring all bridge to excellent schools together um, to see if there's any common um, uh, areas of development which we can work collaboratively together. Next slide. So um, the things that were just shared by my colleagues are things that we've been doing consistently since we've identified Bridge to Excellence Schools. So I just have like a couple of updates that we're really, really excited about. Um, so we're excited to be able to coordinate our, our work with our schools with student services, human resources, and the partnerships that we have in the district. One of the things that we're super excited about, and we can't maximize enough, and I know you all have heard this a million times, is the support that we're getting from our mental health clinicians in our schools and some of the things that we're doing about positive behavioral supports. We also now have within our Bridge to Excellence schools all before our community schools. So with that comes additional resources. Now, I don't want to quote Biggie, but more money, more problems. We have to make sure that we're maximizing how we're spending our money and that we're really working with our schools so that we're targeting a support around the direct needs of each individual school and the students within. Um, we have partnerships with Prince George's County to help engage, re-engage students. And there's some reach out that's happening with parents and um, those partners, which is some really exciting work. Um, extended learning opportunities. It's almost like we have, if you want it, we have it. So both in-person and virtual, and we're just trying to do a better job of coordinating so that we sometimes too much support is, is I call it suffocation. Cause you can't do, you can only do with so much at one time. So we're really trying to make sure that we're maximizing and allowing our schools to determine what's the best mode for them. So whatever they want, we have an avenue for them to be able to access it. We also have additional tutoring services. So in addition to what we're doing in the district, we have partners that are doing tutoring services as well. And then um, with our HR department, we're excited because we have now targeted recruitment strategies where our bridge to excellence schools, they come first. So they get a chance to go to the hiring fairs first and try to get their staffing done um, as soon as possible. So those are some things that we've changed and kind of maximized over the past couple of years, especially in light of COVID. So we're excited about all of that work and seeing the fruits of our labor there. And now I will transition it to Ms. McDaniels. All right, thank you. So our goal across the Division of Academics is to prioritize the instructional support that's provided to the Bridge to Excellence Schools. So we work with school teams to help build their capacity and implementing the curriculum, helping them to adjust their instruction. And this is based on student data so that they can meet the needs of the students in their buildings. So when we look at the support the, provided from the Division of Academics, it primarily falls in three buckets. So first we're looking at systems and structures. So that's the collaborative planning piece and looking at the flow of a lesson, making sure that the instruction is sound. Um, and then monitoring through learning walks, but we're not doing this alone. We participate in learning walks with the area office and school leadership teams, um, our teams as well. And so we're always providing feedback um, on those learning walks to make sure that the observations are really resulting in changed instruction. 
And then finally, that data analysis and understanding of data. So looking at the interim assessments in the curriculum, the systemic assessments, how students in the BTE schools are um, explicitly performing uh, on these assessments. So when we look at the types of support, you can see that support is provided through a variety of different positions and through some of the resources that are purchased for schools. Um, the levels of support um, are ongoing. So you can see the collaborative planning features that I mentioned, our professional development around curriculum documents and understanding the structure of those curriculum documents and how to really make the curriculum come alive in the classroom the structures that are used in the classroom with regards to small grouping um, for students, making sure that there's that follow-up and individualized instruction um, for our students as we're reviewing how they are performing. Um, looking at the explicit work with the school leadership teams to make sure that we are supporting them where they are, answering the questions that they have about um, the curriculum and the look for's. Um, so obviously all of our principals are doing formal observations and that we're supporting them around those observations, but also what they should expect to see. So what does the curriculum look like in action? What should they be looking for? What should they be listening for when they are um, in classrooms? Um, that cross collaboration, again, with the area office and accountability office um, to make sure that we're all on the same page with regards to um, the pieces of the SPP plans, what they are monitoring, and that we are all speaking the same language when we're looking at uh, system data and school-specific data to make sure that um, our students are improving. And finally, um, just the last bullet here, looking at data related to our special populations and how those populations are performing in our BTE schools. Um, so looking at our students who have IEPs and our English learners and what specific supports need to be put into place to make sure that they are part of the conversation as well. So here, um, so originally our presentation was in March, and so this data is um, our March data, but you can see the focus that we put um, on visiting and supporting our BTE schools. So numbers are significantly up from here. Um, but these are just some of the numbers of the school visits just from the curriculum and instruction team um, that we've had, um, again, up until March. And I'm going to just share with you all um, some of our data from some of the platforms that schools have access to. So I'm going to get started with our iReady data. And iReady is available for all of our students K-5 um, to um, improve their reading skills. And they can they use this program at school and at home. They have access at home as well. Um, and so there's a diagnostic that just looks at how students are performing and reading on their respective grade levels. And it personalizes instruction based on how students perform on that diagnostic so that everything is at the right pace for them and that it is meeting their needs. So when we look at, um, this is just some of the data from our fall and winter administrations of the diagnostic assessment. And so as you can see from this data from fall to winter, we had increases where we wanted to have increases and decreases where we wanted to see them as well. And so we have our students um, who are not as far behind. So we see that decrease in the number of students who were below a uh, grade level. And we see an increase in those students who are above or on grade level. And so we can see that progress through, obviously the support that they're getting throughout their daily instruction, um, but also through the platforms that are available to them in reading as well. And here, this just um, outlines the usage data from our uh, BTE schools. And so you can see that increase in um, the use of we getting all of our in the beginning of the year, we're getting everyone on the platform, making sure all of our students have their devices. And as students are progressing throughout the year, there's a, a large increase in their usage of the platform um, as we go throughout the year. Dreambox is our platform that we use for uh, mathematics at the elementary level. 
And so Dreambox really provides the individualized practice um, and lessons for students, whether they need remediation or they need acceleration. So again, another program that's individualized for our students um, to make sure that they have opportunities for extra practice. And it's actually a fun program for our students that they're able to use in class and at home as well to help with their mathematics. So for Dreambox, again, you can see our usage data. Um, we get, our schools are getting to get started, getting everyone on and um, those increases um, in how students are utilizing the platform. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lasser to share some of our challenges. So when we, when we talk about challenges we have, as you can see, we have so many great things happening. One of the things that we're really, really trying to do better at is coordinating and maximizing our efforts. It's very easy if you have a school, some of our schools are Title I schools, now they're community schools, and we have funding. For example, I'll use the example of extended learning opportunities, but we're, we're using it for the same kids, but some of those budget strands require the same thing. So just trying to really work with our principals so that we are maximizing that and that we collectively with our central office partners are working together so that we don't overwhelm our business, our building leaders. So I know that's not on there. So that limited time for intentional collaboration with central office partners and impacted school leaders. We also try to make sure that we work together so that all the business happens in one meeting. So we're not constantly pulling our building leaders out to go to meetings for different departments because that becomes overwhelming. So we really wanna make sure we're on target with that. And then the idea of differentiations, because again, sometimes um, because you're a bridge to excellence schools, you may get specific things allocated to you, but we want to make sure that those things um, actually align with what the needs are in the school and helping schools to be able to identify those things so we can maximize those resources. The next three bullets, of course, human capital needs, um, certified teachers, um, novice and non-tenured teachers and gaps with pedagogy is always a challenge that we've been working with our CNI partners on. And then, um, of course, of late, the number of subs that we've had and inconsistency with teacher assignments. So those are things that have definitely impacted us that we're trying to combat as we move forward. And then systemic challenges, of course, chronic absenteeism. We had a lot of shifts this year, um, specifically with bringing students back into school on a concurrent basis and then full-time in person, especially for elementary schools. Those have been some of the things that have really been um, challenging for us to work with our building leaders as they try to maneuver through those things. Back to you, Ms. McDaniel. And so on the academic side, um, just the pacing of our curriculum. Um, so of course, with some teachers being out, some students being out, just keeping the momentum and staying on pace within um, our curriculum, um, the gaps that we might see in student learning, um, again, related to those human capital needs that Dr. Laster mentioned. Um, so many substitutes um, in the school, in the BT schools and teacher turnover, or just new teachers who are um, getting their footing with supporting students. Um, making sure that we provide the appropriate professional development to have a strong foundation uh, for content for our teachers so that they are in the curriculum and understand how the curriculum is being develop, developed and the opportunities for collaboration amongst teachers who are supporting school students throughout the school. So that being the general education, our ESOL teachers, our special education teachers. Um, and so we just want to help to support in schools who are going through um, helping with monitoring um, pieces of curriculum implementation to make sure that there's that ongoing feedback for teachers in each school and that teachers know that when the Division of Academics is coming in that we are here to support. It's not a gotcha. Um, and so that there's that willingness to receive support to be able to improve their instruction um, so that everyone can grow. And um, a couple with that, just the time for ongoing professional development. So all of our professional development is in the evening and or during um, some of the collaborative planning time. And so just making that time so that um, teachers are getting the support that they need. So just thinking about how um, the board can continue to um, support both of our teams, um, we just appreciate your consistent communication 
um, and to help us to address the needs of stakeholders, bringing any of that to our attention um, as we make sure that we are supporting our neediest schools, our BTE schools. So with that said, we'll wrap up there and take any questions that you have. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Morrow, Dr. McDaniel, Dr. Curry, Dr. Lassiter. Um, hope I didn't miss anyone there <laughs> for that great presentation. Um, and so I know I have two questions and I wanted to make sure that my colleagues have an opportunity to ask any questions as well. Um, so I will just give a, a moment here if you all want to go ahead and ask any questions and then we can we can continue. That means we did a great job. <laughs> well, you, you, you threw in a biggie no, this, reference. This is, uh, I mean, you threw in a biggie reference, so that automatically just, you know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, I um I wanted to uh, start uh, off hello, with just, Oh, okay, go ahead, Dr. Um, go ahead, uh, Curtis. I was going to say, I'm sorry. Uh, something jumped out at me when I saw the schools, um, and maybe because it's in my neighborhood, that you have... This, for example, Oxen Hill Elementary, Oxen Hill Middle, and then Potomac and, and Crossland on there. And so there's a potential for a student to literally go through their entire educational experience in the school like this. Um, and I, I guess my question is, particularly in the South, uh, again, this is sort of my neighborhood, um, is there even um, an additional level of, of attention being in this area because you have almost a pipeline of schools from elementary all the way up through through high school uh, where a student could, could, be, could continue to fall into a, a school like this. You know what I'm saying? Were you asking that, were you asking that as a question or were you basically making a statement? Uh, well, well, I guess it, it's, it's sort of a question in that, you know, what is what is it about this particular area where we, we have a concentration seemingly um, where, I mean, you had three high schools up there at Northwestern, uh, in the ex kind of extreme north somewhat, um, and then you had two in the south and not much in the central, but then also you look at some of the, I'm sure there's, there's some, some spreading of the middle and, and elementary but is there something about the South where you're seeing, whether it be finding staff, all the things, all the obstacles, and all the challenges you all mentioned, is are the challenges to a greater extent in one part of the county? And if so, is there anything we can draw to that? And if so, what are we doing to address it? I wouldn't say that it's you know specific just to a particular part of the county. It too, it depends upon, as was said previously in the um, communication around star ratings, and that is the state assessment data itself. Now, what it has done, though, is given us an opportunity to look more closely at, as I referenced previously, those speeder pattern structures to see how students are matriculating from elementary to middle and on to high. So the instructional programs, um, the um, student assessments, all of the supports that were just referenced are all resources that are being utilized to help us to improve the student achievement at each of those schools. We also look not only just for the instructional content, we look as well to the absenteeism data. So we look at a full scale of different types of data sources. In addition to the need for more parental involvement, that is the case in some of those schools, I would say that. So that's why in my conversations with Dr. Jackson, we've been very deliberate around getting more parental involvement so that parents are more able to help assist their students academically as well. So it's a lot full scale of implementation. It is ironic that most of those schools, as you just referenced, do seem to be in that area. But you know what we've done is just increase the methodologies that we're using to chase that student data, to find out specifically why to the data, to use that data to inform the instructional program. And I love the idea that, um, and, and that we've done for some years now as referenced by both Dr. Laster and Dr. McDaniel, 
the presence of us having collective groups of individuals going into the schools so that we can see specifically what is going on in them instructionally as it relates to curriculum implementation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you for that question. I have a few questions and I think the best thing for me to do, I'm gonna ask all of them and then we can kind of go through them and then uh, we'll go to Dr. Miller. I see your hand just went up there. Um, so maybe if we wanna write these down and then we can kind of go back through them. Um, but I want to start the first question with the feeder pattern. Uh, give, Crossland is going to be the, the CTE hub. I'm correcting that, right? So I think that's like an amazing opportunity for us to have some amazing CTE experiences at the schools feeding into Crossland. So I'm wondering, what are we doing at those feeder schools to support them in careers in technology and exposure to tech starting in elementary and middle school. Um, so I just wanted to know what we're doing um, at those feeder schools. <clears throat> so I know last year I was really proud uh, to bring forward and to support with my colleagues after seeing your presentation last year, uh, a budget amendment where we provided $10 million just for Bridge to Excellence schools. And so uh, hearing about a lot of the extended day opportunities, which was really what that money, I believe, was earmarked for um, to support uh, after school busing and those types of programs. I'd like to hear a little bit more about how the impact of that funding has helped to support some of those interventions and additional programs that you all have mentioned. Because, um, you know, it seems to me, you know, hearing Dr. Lassiter's slides, um, that that has made an impact. So maybe if we could talk a bit more about that. <clears throat> um, additionally, um, just three, three things that I'm really trying to really hear more about when it comes to our, our, our schools that are, have been chronically low performing. <clears throat> and, and this is what I really like to talk about. You know, I'm hearing a lot about sort of the data collection and monitoring, uh, which is certainly important. But I wanted to know how are we measuring sort of these three things? Um, number one, grade level instruction. So like, how are we measuring that every classroom that we're going into, that there's grade level instruction happening? Like, is that part of our evaluation metric, some of the look for us that we are looking at in all of the monitoring we're doing? Number two, the students access to high quality instructional materials. I know that we, t um, Dr. McDaniel talked about <clears throat> the professional development and training to help build up the capacity of our teachers to do the curriculum that we have. Um, but, you know, what is our metric for measuring whether or not all of these students are engaging with high quality on grade level instructional materials every day? And then lastly, one thing I didn't hear, but I know is a priority for this department <clears throat> are deeper learning experiences, right? You know, how are we engaging these students? These students are deserving of deeper learning experiences as well. You know what I'm saying? Just because they have been chronically underperforming, they deserve access to project-based learning, exploratory learning, place-based learning. And so I wanna know sort of, are we doing some intentional work about <clears throat> providing professional development, special curriculum, special pilot opportunities for that to happen? Because we know that deeper learning can be a huge driver of literacy. <clears throat> and so, those are, those are my questions there. And then we can just take some time to chat about those and then go to Dr. Miller. So I'll, I'll start off. Um, one of the things I'll say about a deeper learning experience, I don't ever want anyone to think that every child in our district wouldn't have a deeper learning experience. I don't care if you're special education versus tag, the experiences that every single child in our district deserves needs to be rich and needs to be grounded in standards every single day, every minute that they're in our schools. So our professional development is grounded in not only making sure that they understand the standard, but they understand the standard at the rigor and level by which the standard should be taught at a grade level. So you have a special education student that's in fifth grade, but might be on a third grade level. While we still have to give exposure to that standard at a fifth grade level, we then have to work with teachers on how do you modify and provide accommodations to that curriculum to scaffold them down to bring them back up. And that comes by way of, and you know this, um, 
uh, board member Adam Stafford by way of uh, differentiation by way of some students in a class. I have to, you know, when I when I give you a test multiple choice, I understand that there's difficulty there. So I spend time once a week, whenever we get ready for assessments to have those conversations with you. Talk me through what you've learned today so that I can do exit tickets to know that the kid is getting it in a way that they need it. And so I, I never, and I'm saying this because I know we have parents or anybody else watching, Every child in our district should have a rich, deep experience, regardless of any school you're in, whether it's a star five, star one. If you're not on a star rating, you're going to get you should receive that level. And that's that should be our obligation at all costs. I know that the work um, and I'll let the associates and Kia jump in. But when we talk about also access to high quality um, um, uh, uh, instructional materials, you know, by MSDE, we have to make sure and they're doing a lot with all of our content supervisors to make sure that we have access to see what falls on that list to make sure that we're continually building those things into our curriculums as we're moving to Canvas, making sure that this year we try to provide our teachers even with what those modules in Canvas should look like to be a complete module. So how do you provide students with a PowerPoint? How do you provide students with an assignment, with a video to go to it? How do you pull in the top rated um, instructional materials for students to understand and get it. That's why when we pick certain um, interventions and enrichment programs this year, we made sure we vet it. We tried to check the list to see what their ratings were. We're looking at our data to make sure that we're not just spending money on things that's not working. So our task this summer will be to look at that data and determine anything that really either students weren't engaged, they weren't in, getting teacher surveys, what worked, what didn't work, is to eliminate those things that you know, we just fell on the ground and weren't good for our, our teachers or our students. And then the last one you mentioned was on grade level instruction. And I, and I think the area office will say, um, along with us, is that we have monitoring documents for our, our teachers to know what should take place. We have scope and sequences in place. We have collaborative planning in place so that our teachers can vertically and horizontally talk to one another about building quality lessons and we have looked for documents for our administrators so that we're in there in the classroom that they are checking off that they're seeing you know are we on pace are we off pace if we're off pace what happened and then our professional development backs that up by providing them ways that they scaffold back in that curriculum to hit those areas that they could have missed or areas that students didn't perform well and does that mean we're perfect absolutely not and um, does that mean that we find areas to grow? Dr. Coley and I are already talking about ways by which we can get next year, you know, at a moment's notice and see what we see in the terms of data that's provided, where they are in alignment to where they should be, and how do we go back and course correct as we go. So I'm really excited about hopefully a walk in the door without sending kids and teachers home every chance we get and have a full solid year in our curriculums, um, because unfortunately, some of these ratings um, that you see oftentimes don't tell the real picture of what happens in some of our amazing schools. And unfortunately, the star rating was done years ago when we last tested, what, 2018, 2019. And some of the schools that are on this list, we follow these amazing things. So with that, that I'm off my soapbox and I'm going to turn it over to our associate superintendent and director of C. But could I just interject one moment because you said something. I was on the edge of my seat when you said that, Ms. Adam, board member Adam Stafford regardless to where the school is located here in Prince George's County, we service all schools and all students in the same way. A zip code of a student never takes away for the instructional program and expectations that exist within all. So I want to make that perfectly clear. We monitor, monitor, and monitor. Dr. White and I this year have begun to as well conduct some paired school observations so we can actually go out, look at the schools, provide the extended support that is needed, if needed, because our associate superintendents and our IDs, instructional directors, are with these schools and focusing on these schools each and every day. So we use data. We use data continuously. I love to see instruction occurring when I can go across a grade level and I'm that Dr. White and I can leave out of there and say, oh yeah, they've been doing collaborative planning. It's perfectly clear when we look at the instructional implementation that exists. So I just wanna reiterate it, that again. We provide equity to all students and all schools. That's what we're here for here in Prince George's County. Yeah, and I think I just wanna clarify my point about deeper learning. So I, what I'm asking for are, what are the opportunities at Bridge to Excellence schools for students to engage in like project-based learning 
diff different types of deeper learning experiences because that was one thing I didn't hear in the presentation, but I know that that's a priority for our academic department. We've talked about it a lot this year. And so I just wanted to know, are there any <clears throat> specific sort of like curriculums that we're considering or trainings that are giving teachers that training um, and support to engage in some of those instructional methods in these schools? So that's, that was my question there. So I could jump in right there and okay, reference Dr. To, to Potomac High School, for example, where we have our 3DE program, um, and that is all project-based. And so um, by the end of, we had a cohort that started out um, in just ninth grade where we had a, a cohort of students that was in the program, and then their current ninth graders all are part of the program. And so they get project-based learning. They uh, We partner with different companies where the students actually present the project to the companies and um, and then they actually get a chance to go to the companies now that we're in co um, we're coming out of COVID. And so um, that when you talk about the feeder pattern, all of our middle schoolers are also able to go to JA Finance, which actually is a part of that whole model of the business model and the project-based learning. And so that ties right into the high school component. And we'll actually, while Sarasville is not, um, Bridge to Excellence, they'll actually have a program next year as well. And so we are beginning to grow our um, project-based learning in our Bridge to Excellence schools in particular. And then as it relates to the CTE component um, with Crossland, our goal is to get Crossland up and running and right. then come back down and backwards map into those that programming for the middle and the elementary students to get their interest going early on. Um, right now, it's just getting the ball rolling in one hub, which is taking a lot of work just to get our students transferred over and getting them used in our staff used to a, a different mindset and a different component in one school, um, which we'll have on the northern end as well. But definitely preparing our students um, at the middle school and the elementary level would be part of that feeder that we would work with CTE on um, just to gain that interest and that experience early. That, that's really exciting to hear. And Dr. Morrow, I wanted to just ask with the 3DE program at Potomac, and this is the first, let me just make sure I'm correctly understanding, this is the first year that you're doing this with, with all ninth graders or with a group of the ninth graders there? This is the first year of all ninth graders. The first year we implemented the program as a cohort model where there mm -hmm. were maybe 150 students um, that were in the cohort. Now, the, the current ninth graders all went in. Okay project-based learning um, into the model. So I, I'd love to know from that pilot year, did you notice gains in literacy and other forms of like engagement with kids that did that pilot? And Definitely. what are you expecting? Yeah, I, I'd love to know. What are you expecting this, this now cohort with all ninth graders that are, have now gone through? What are you expecting to So the, in, the interesting thing, we definitely can get you some data um, because we have some data that shows the difference in the students that were in the actual cohort versus the comprehensive students that were not. And yeah. so we can actually share that data with you because we did see some gains in their attendance, their grades, um, the engagement components. We had students that we knew were middle schoolers who um, were at Bridge the Excellence School, for example, Thurgood Marshall, um, Benjamin Starter, and the principals came on and watched them in a whole different light and couldn't believe right. it was the same child, you know? And so we've, we've had a lot of success stories that even as, as Dr. White said, sometimes the data may not show it in that way, but we definitely see a difference in their mental health, their social emotional, um, as well as their academic performance. So we definitely can get that data for you um, to show the difference. And the interesting piece is through this, we were in COVID. And so mm -hmm. they were able to do oh, this wow. virtually and then come in to do it face-to-face, -face, um, which has been very different um, this year. So it's, 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 it's been amazing just to see the work of the students. And Dr. White will tell you in almost every meeting, I'm saying, we need to talk about our assets. And that is an asset that we need to be shouting out that PBL in a British to Excellence school is changing student engagement. That's, that is awesome. So I'd love to hear more about that. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. No also, I just wanted to add in there just from a, a feeder a perspective that at two of the schools, and I know uh, Crossland was mentioned, um, we have had the Project Lead the Way, okay. which is project-based um, at the schools, and also Gateway, uh, Gateway Technologies, which is a STEM-based program. And so just trying to offer, although all students are not enrolled in them classes, 
um, students can actually choose, but it does allow for early exposure to STEM-based programs and project learning prior to entering high school. And even if students aren't in any of those programs, individual programs at those schools, we have to remember that our core curriculum for every student includes signature projects across K-12 that students are participating in. We have you know, certain field trips available for students that are right in our county through JA Finance Park, through Howard B. Owen Science Center, through the William Schmidt Science Center that all of our students have access to. And so that's a part of the core that every student's gonna get, whether they're in 3D Scholars or in our, I'm sorry, 3D E program or any of our other programs, they will still have access to the, the deeper learning through those projects and opportunities and experiences. Okay, thank you. And the only thing I would add on, because my colleagues did such an amazing job, you mentioned about the um, money for Bridge to Excellence schools that we've been using for extended learning. So we've been really excited to be able to really cater those programs. They look very different. So some schools want to do three weeks on intensive with this cohort of students and then come back another time and do another cohort. And then we're even extending it throughout the summer. And we, we usually don't have an opportunity to do that. But they were really able to identify what their needs were and draft their program however it, they wanted it to be, as long as they had evidence to support that this is what needed to happen. And we've been able to make that happen throughout all of our schools. So we're excited about that. And if you spoke to the principals, they would tell you the same thing. And then you mentioned about the grade level, you talk about monitoring um, the grade level instruction. So one of the, and I think we mentioned this before, one of the things that we really were intentional about is doing really deep dives in all of our schools. We did inquiry cycles with our partners where we looked at every aspect from every last one of our Bridge to Excellence schools and our CNI partners and central office partners as the experts in the room were able to say, okay, this is something that may not be going right in this particular area, but this is how I'm gonna support you with that. And this is how we're gonna develop the plan. And then we also had cohorts of teachers that were doing professional development together. We have maximized it so we can use our resources so that it's not just school A, with three teachers who are non-tenured who need the support. If they needed that in the three other schools, we pulled those people together to make that happen. And so the way that we've been able to work and pivot in a very short amount of time with very targeted support is unique. And I think that, are we tired? Of course, but we've been working really, really hard and we're excited about the results that we're getting. So we really thank our CNI partners for all of that work as well. Thank and, you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Curry. No, and I just want to add, I, I, I don't want us to miss that uh, school leaders are consistently monitoring instruction in the classroom through formal and informal observations. And so um, our principals uh, receive training around framework for teaching. As we mentioned earlier, one of the supports of Bridge of Excellence Schools are the visits for the instructional directors. Uh, oftentimes the topic during those visits are um, centers around the feedback being provided to teachers based on these classroom observations, formal and informal, and then also working with our partners um, and in curriculum because many of our Bridge to Excellence schools also receive support from coaches. And so coordinating with those coaches around the gaps that uh, the principals or a uh, leadership team are noticing in the classroom and making sure that there's relevant uh, training provided to those teachers that are, that are showing gaps in instruction. Thank you so much. And Dr. Curry and Dr. Lassiter, uh, thank you for the breakdown of how those funds supported individual schools and some of the uh, variation that happened there. And I think that I think the rest of our colleagues would like to know that as well so that we can continue to fund and support that. So maybe we can talk to Dr. Miller about presenting that to the full board uh, just to know the impact of how that funding supported at the school level. Okay, um, Dr. Miller, the, uh, your hand was up. Thank you so much. Um, so my question is rather broad and maybe you being new, you may have already addressed it, but as, as um, I think Dr. Lassiter was going through the challenges, one of the ones that stood out to me was the one about the non-tenured teachers because we know that we're in a teaching crisis, right? And this is not a data point that's unique to Prince George's County. This is a national, um, crisis. So as I thought about it, you know, and, and I've been grappling with this since our last presentation, actually, um, during our board work session, is what can we as a board start looking at to help um, 
in supporting the causes that you already have in place. Because you're working with these teachers, putting a lot of work into these schools, you know, growing these teachers, offering them professional development, and then they get certified and they may go to another school, you know, and then you're back to square one. Are there some um, structures or maybe, I don't want to call it incentives, but are there some programs we could start thinking about um, to consider? You know, I watched um, my colleague, um, Curtis Valentine, put together the um, Real Men Teach program, ensuring that he really uh, put some emphasis on increasing the underrepresented males within the education profession. So now in thinking about this, with the schools that you're re really putting a lot of work into to maintain the level as you continue moving up, what are some things that we should consider? Um, and it's maybe something that you would say we want to think about and then come back to you. But I would really like to start thinking about, are there some things that we can get ahead of because the crisis is national? And if there's some things that we can start thinking about now to help support as you move forward. Yeah, I would, I would go ahead, Dr. Cole. I see you came off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Many of our schools even have within what they refer to as a new teacher or a um, conditionally certified teacher academy. Some of our schools, it is not consistent through all of them, but then many of them provide supports to the teaching staff to help them to provide a support to them. And as Dr. Uh, Baldwin referenced during the last board meeting, we provide support to them as well to help them with you know, <laughs> the assessments that they themselves have to take in order to be certified. So we are continuing to work on those structures. I would ask Dr. Miller, if you give us a little bit more time to think through that more effectively and to come back with some other novice and creative ways by which we can continue to keep our teachers here in Prince George's County, as you referenced, we hate to see it when they become certified and no longer are with us. So one way that we are working too is through our strategic plan. And through our strategic plan currently, we're looking at ways by which we can continue to provide supports to our staff so that they continue to want to do well and to want to be amongst us here in Prince George's County. So I'd like to say it's a work in progress. Um, and as you've referenced, it is across the spectrum in many school jurisdictions where they're being faced with the same thing, but we certainly recognize the need and, and definitely want a teacher. I, I always say this, in keeping our teachers here in Prince George's County, we recognize the need for us, all of us, to develop those relationships of support. In the absence of effective relationships, we, we do likely um, lose some of them. So that's always at the forefront of the decision. Before we start talking about digging deep into the instruction, we have to definitely recognize the need for us to develop good relationships with our teaching staff. So we'll come back with you. Dr. White may have had some additional things to add to that or some of the other team members, but I, um, it, it is something that we continue to discuss and to give attention to because it's real. Thank you so much. And, and I know it's something that you've probably been grappling with. And I would, I would welcome any feedback that you say, you know, as a board, start thinking about this so that we can provide the support that you need to continue the work that you see. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miller. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? I, I know I was wondering, I, I know that we saw a slide in terms of the numbers of visits to individual schools. Um, and so I wanted to know a couple of things. How, how do those numbers compare to schools that aren't Bridge to Excellence schools? And I know that one of the challenges that I believe I saw on that slide was around, uh, I guess, maybe teacher resistance to some of the professional development or train or new 
practices, and I, I don't want to misquote it, but maybe if we can go back to that slide under some of the challenges. And I'm wondering um, if you've considered how the frequency of the visits may contribute to some of the resistance you may be encountering on the ground in regards to some of the support that you're providing. And I know you all talked about really wanting to establish partnerships with schools and teachers so they don't feel um, like, you know, that, that you aren't partners with them in this journey and in this work. So I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit about that. Um, so one of our goals for the division is to, well, and actually specifically my department, um, curriculum instruction, is to make sure that we are visiting our Bridge to Excellence schools at least 16 times throughout the school year. So there's just that focus support, but you can see that those numbers were far beyond um, that, that minimum of 16. And that's just to ensure that they receive the direct support um, based on the support that the principal um, says that they need specific support, our collaboration with the area office. And so if you look at the overall support that we provide to schools, the majority will be at our, our BTE schools, um, and but that's part of a collaboration. And so it's not that we just want to, you know, descend upon schools and say, oh, we're here to do, um, you know, telling people what to do, but just to really actually be a support where needed, um, getting in the content areas where the support is needed, where new teachers are, and really where the school leadership and area office sees that there's a need and then also the needs that arise out of those learning walks that we mentioned. And so there might be specific teams that really need some targeted support with their planning, uh, with staying on pace on how to use some of the oil, online platforms on how to really deliver the curriculum as it's written. And so that's where you'll see that increase in the numbers of um, support. And it's through a variety of different positions. So as um, Dr. Curry mentioned, we have in some departments, we have coaches. Um, we have some coaches that are assigned to the school, some coaches that support a variety of different schools, but that they are on a rotation um, supporting schools as needed to make sure that, that we are moving the needle with student data uh, in those schools. So just so just so that I'm understanding, Dr. McDaniel, those visits are sort of like a compilation of coaching, targeted assistance, technical assistance, all of those things sort of wrapped into one. So it really is a wraparound support. Okay. Absolutely. So, so we okay. I did not outline it on the um, slide that I have for you, but when we fill out a school visit form just so that we can track how we're supporting schools. Mm -hmm. And so we say, were we there for collaborative planning? Were we there to assist with data analysis? Were we there to aid in, um, you know, doing a, a lesson, a model lesson? So just kind of breaking it down what those visits were for. Um, but it's not just stopping by the school and saying, you know, oh, I caught a teacher not using the curriculum right. or anything like that. <laughs> sure. it, it's very targeted support um, that is planned and part of a larger plan of how we're supporting the school. And so what I'd love to know, Dr. McDaniel, since you are, you know, having that level of specificity in terms of how you're providing support during those visits, what is giving you the biggest bang for your buck, right? Is the coaching that you're like, if you're at a school and like 60% of your visits are st around uh, maybe like math coaching support, are you seeing increases in their dream box work or their 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 work around math literacy? Or if most of your, your um, visits are around, you know, what maybe leadership development, are you seeing like differences in, in teacher evaluations or more you know, support for teachers in terms of like your their newer teachers. But I just I, I would love to know sort of like how the support that you're providing is translating to student outcomes in terms of where are you seeing the the biggest impact. Yeah, and we can dig a little deeper into that. I will say mm -hmm. that because our the schools are so large and so they have large staff and so there might be, you know, a content team who is there for a quarter helping a specific teacher just every other day, right? Or there could be a team that needs collaborative plan, help with collaborative planning in another part of the building and another content area. So it is gonna be uh, varied and very, you know, based on the time of year, but we can definitely dig a little bit deeper into those pieces. 
because maybe that might be an area where the board can support as well. Like if you're finding, hey, you know, when we provide extra support and technical assistance, we see greater usage in our online program or greater scores in our online program, you know, and that may be an area that we can provide more funding for, but just helping us to understand sort of how your work translates to student outcomes in terms of some of the, what you observe um, when you're going in to provide that direct support. And I, I think a lot of it is, you know, really trying to understand your learner, right? So Dr. Lasseter mentioned from the very beginning that each of those schools are so uniquely different. So we could have had a canned approach and said, you know, definitely we're going to go into all schools and do these three things, but you kind of had to be on the ground, see what they were in need of and try to help fill gaps. And so because it's so varied, the reason we did a document just to capture it was so that we could have conversations with our school partner sides and say, you know, this time we spent time in collaborative planning so that when their ideas follow up the principal, they can, you know, continue to follow the work through. So we were able to check that, but we also try to just be very responsive to what we know at the end of the day is just going to build good, solid practices that should be in place in every single school and try to help fill the gap in those schools so that ultimately those practices become um, succession in those schools and become what you would just expect in a model school. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. <clears throat> okay. All right, we're coming up on the end here. So if there are no other questions, um, I guess I'll move on here. But I just want to thank everyone for being here this evening and, and providing us with your presentations. Um, colleagues, the follow-up items from the April 25th committee meeting are posted upon board docs. And our next academic achievement meeting <clears throat> will be June 13th at 5.30 p.m. Um, I, again, thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I really do appreciate these uh, presentations and I wanted to see if I could have a motion to adjourn. Okay, second. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we are adjourned. Aye. Oh, I right. <laughs> thank you. We are adjourned. All right. Thank you all so much for being here and good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Anise. <laughs>